polar optics, and we can't understand nonlinear optics without linear optics. So I'm going to take this through in an hour, 150 years. Uh, this is the physics version of this talk. So if you are not a physicist here, um, and you see equations, do not worry about them. Okay? You don't have to understand those equations to understand my talk. So don't get upset when you see the equations. But if you are a physics student, and you don't understand these equations, then please ask the question because you shouldn't. <laughs> okay. So we're going to start with these very, very famous equations. These are Maxwell's equations. Middle of the 19th century. Before this time, scientists were asking the question, is light made up of particles, or is light made up of waves? And there was reason to believe both. Now, the modern day of quantum optics, they're still trying to figure this out. But back in the day, when we still only had classical physics, light could not be both a wave and a particle. It had to be one or the other, and they struggled to figure this out. And then along came this theorist, or mathematician, Maxwell, and he took three, well, he took actually four pieces of information that experimentalists have figured out. And this mathematician only added this one extra piece, but he gets to call these equations Maxwell's equations in any case, because he put the four together. And from these four together, he came up with a wave equation, which is down here. And the wave equation that we use in optics comes because we don't have charges usually in glass. We don't have currents, so we get rid of those and make them zero. We don't have magnetic properties, so they stay the same. But we can change this thing called epsilon, the index of refraction. All right, so if it was vacuum we are talking about, this would be epsilon naught. This mu naught epsilon naught would be 1 over uh, the square of the speed of light. And so when Maxwell came up with these equations, and he showed that electromagnetic waves travel at the speed of light, and the experimentalists already knew that light traveled at the speed of light, which is why it was given the name, <laughs> then he went, well, then light must be a wave. And it was so powerful a theory, everybody sort of had to agree, light must be a wave. But it was a classical wave. I don't know much about pointing, but he has this vector named after him. But what he showed was that this uh, equation, again, you don't need to know the equation, but there was this power per unit area, and it is proportional to the amplitude squared. Now, if you're a real optics person, and I have a PhD in optics, so I am, uh, it's called irradiance. But I'm also a laser person, and for some reason, laser people did not want to say we have irradiant lasers. We want to say we have intense lasers. So we call it intensity. And we just, we just do that. Okay, so it depends. If you're a real optics person, you're going to call this a radius, but from now on, I'll call it intensity. But again, if you know about waves, and I get that you're a landlocked country, but I hear you have a beautiful lake, I haven't seen it, but hopefully you get to walk on a beach, and you will know that if the waves are small, they hardly move the stones on the beach. But you, when the waves get big, and you don't want to be in a boat when the waves get really big, that's the power of the wave, is in the height of the wave, not the distance between the peaks. This is what this says, and so long comes to the end of the uh, 19th century, and they start doing these experiments. Again, I'm an experimentalist, so I will be one of the first to say that the theorist can tell us something, but until the experimentalist sees it, it's not really true. So the experimentalists started to do these experiments at the end of the 19th century, just analogous to watching stones on a beach being picked up the beach by the water waves. They shone light on material and watched the electrons come off. So then they would turn up the power and the electrons should come off faster because there would be more power. It should have nothing to do with the distance between the crests, which is the color you see, the wavelength, the inverse of that is the frequency. And yet, lo and behold, when people were doing these experiments, they all found the same thing, that when they shone red light, no electrons came off, no matter how powerful it was. If you use green light, electrons came off, but at low speed. And then finally, if you use violet light, it came off at this higher speed. And if you turned up the power, more electrons would come off, but at the same high speed. So the speed the electrons came off was not about how high the waves were, but the distance between the crests. And so this flew in the face of 
light being a wave. It made no sense. Until Einstein came along and you know, explained what we call the photoelectric effect. Now he got the Nobel Prize, and he, we all know that Einstein could have won so many Nobel Prizes, and whatever the history of why he didn't win so many Nobel Prizes, we in optics do like to point out that what he did win his Nobel Prize for is explain this optics effect of the photoelectric effect. Now I've also given this talk at a place that had a lot of atomic and molecular and optical physicists, and they complained that I only gave Einstein credit for it. Okay, so I've added Max Planck, but it was Max Planck, because I used to go on and talk about now that he knew that um, what Max Planck showed us in 1900 was the fact that the energy of a light wave cannot continuously change. It has to change in a fundamental unit, and so the energy is quantized, and this fundamental unit is um, related to the frequency or the color of the light. And so it was Einstein that showed that if that photon energy is bigger than the energy of the electron is being held to the atom of the material, then the electron goes off with the difference in energy. You see, when we talk about this to our students, we're talking about the quantum mechanics of it. But for this talk, this is an example of a linear optical effect, because it is one photon interacting with one atom at a time. And if that one photon has more energy than what that electron is experiencing in its atom, it kicks off. And of course, we always have conservation of energy, and so it's the difference of energy that the electron takes off. So now by the beginning of the uh, 20th century, we were pretty sure we understood how light and matter interact. And then along came this woman, Maria Gothamir, now she's famous for being the second woman to win a Nobel Prize. But that's the work she did when she was in her 50s in the 1950s at Oregon National Lab. And it's about the nuclear shell model, which I know nothing about. So we're not here to talk about her Nobel Prize. <laughs> we're here to talk about what did she do when she was a graduate student. This is the amazing thing because I actually cite her PhD in my PhD. She, as a graduate student, asked the question, why can't atoms absorb two photons at the same time? Why are they stuck, you know, absorbing one photon at a time? And so she went through the whole theory and showed, indeed, it was possible, theoretically possible, that atoms would absorb two photons and leave an atom in an excited state. So again, this is, these pictures are much more for the physicists, but still, if you're not a physicist, let me tell you that we almost always depict energy with gravitational energy. We all understand that, you know, it's hard to climb up the stairs. It takes energy to go up, right? And the higher you drop the ball, the faster it's going when it gets to the bottom. And so we draw energy always sort of as these ladders going up. And so up is higher energy. So what she showed is that you could have a photon with this frequency and add it to the photon energy of this frequency and get up from the M level to the M level. She also showed quantum mechanically that you had to have at least three levels at play, or this would not happen. Okay, that's again just for the physicists, the rest of you don't really need to care about that. I will say that in today's pictures, we will still show the photon lines like this. We have quit showing these dotted lines. Because quantum mechanically, we don't really think about it necessarily taking this path and some probability of all of these things, and it's sort of much more flat, isn't it? But let's not worry about that. She had these lovely pictures in her uh, 1931 paper. And she showed that two up, you can also have the photon energy of one, subtract the photon energy of the other, and still end up here. She also showed that if you have a start in the excited state, you could do the reverse and have what we now call spontaneous two photon conversions. So she showed us all of this, 1930, okay, 1931, but also now she's so long there on this paper. Okay, remarkable woman. And so she said it should happen, 1931. Nobody saw it until, oh, I keep forgetting which way I'm going. I was going to give you the public version. Well, I still have to explain some physics to you. Sorry. For, the, for those of you that are physicists in the room, the rest of you, it doesn't go on. So these are Maxwell's equations. So what did, what did Marie Goldmeier do? She said, okay, the difference here is what, this is the only line that I've changed. Before, I just said that D was linearly proportional to E. And this is because what is really happening when the light comes in and hits material is that the light pushes the negative charges one way and the positive charges the other way and sets up these dipoles. All right? 
And so how much, do, how much dipole do you get? And so it is some function of E. But it doesn't have to be linear with E. It's just some function of E. And so again, physicists will then take some function and we'll approximate it and we will have this expansion where we have these different terms in E. This one is actually nonlinear materials. If you study electricity and magnetism in materials, you will study this term. We don't care about it, so let's ignore this term. That's if you already have a dipole. This is the term that's proportional to E and would have given us proportional to E. But now she added this next term. She didn't go beyond. She just added this one more term to here. And I can tell you solving equations that makes it a whole lot harder. This is why in Canada this would be a graduate course. Okay? But I understand that other places do it in as undergrads. But let's just look at that term. Now again, if you're a theorist or a mathematician, you're going to cringe when you see my, okay, so if you're not physics at all, you might think, I don't want to look at equations at all. And if you really deal with equations all the time, you're going to be mad that I go so loose and free with my equations, okay? But I'm just telling a story. So don't worry about me not actually doing it correctly. All right, so um, I get that this should be a 10 to effective, but let's not worry. So let's take this electric field and we're going to square it. So now because, you know, she showed we can have two different frequencies, our electric field can come from two different colors, and so we have color one and color two. And of course it's real, so we have complex conjugates, and we're going to square these four terms. This one, squared by itself, gives you two of the same frequency up. This is what we call harmonic generation. Uh, two of the other frequency up. This is the one she showed, omega one frequency. I, I'm too lazy to put it in the two pi, so I use omega and that leaf. But uh, she uh, showed two of those frequencies up. She also showed us this one, the big one up, and the small one down. Okay. She didn't show us these DC ones. But all these terms were there, and she showed how it would work, and theoretically it should work. We didn't see it until 1961. Now before I explain why this Michigan group didn't see it until 1961, and what they saw was really called nonlinear optics. So I want to explain the difference between multi-photon physics, which I was just at a multi-photon physics conference, and many of them also had not heard that there was a difference. So I'm glad I had got to teach them this. It was 30 years before I knew there was a difference between nonlinear optics and multi-photon physics. And the difference is, if you are an atomic or a molecular physicist watching what happens to the atom or the molecule, you do multi-photon physics. If you're an optics person and watch what happens to the light, you're doing nonlinear optics. Very subtle difference, but that's the difference. And this one was a nonlinear optical thing that they saw, but the two photon absorption, which we were told Mary told us about, was also seen in 1961, but two months later. Second harmonic generation, which is what was seen, is the atom momentarily absorbs the energy of two photons, but it doesn't release it as two photons, it releases it as one photon twice the energy. So when they saw it the very first time, it was only one part in a million to ten million. So a very small effect. And way back in the day, young people aren't going to understand this, we had to use film. We did not have CCD cameras, we had to use film. And so they had a film in their spectrometer, and so they really had to saturate where the fundamental red laser beam was going, so that they could see the small dot that was at twice the frequency. And the dot was so small, they thought they'd better put the arrow here to point to the small dot. Now, even the people in the front row can see, he's staring hard. At the back row, I can see him staring hard. But even the people in the front row can't see the dot. And that's because, back in the day, when we used film, all journals had to have film editors. And the job of the film editor was to take away all the specks on the photo that were there due to dust and noise. And so even though there was an arrow pointing to the spot, the film editor still thought it was just a piece of dirt and erased the uh, foam picture. So this is still the way it appears in physical letters to this day, but we all know that they really did see the dot and it was just the film editor that took it out. The photo editor took it out. So anyways, this is the original data. I like to show the original data just to you know, show you the fun little things that we all know around later on. Anyway, so why did it take 30 years? Oh, thank you, one of those who knows. It's because the laser was invented in 1960. So this is part of my Nobel talk. And so these are the people that won the Nobel Prize in lasers ahead of me. Vasov and Prokhorov were working together in Russia. Towns was working independently from him in the United States. 
They all came up with the maser. The M in maser stands for microwaves, where L stands for light. Technologically, it was easier to make a maser than a laser, and so they had that going in the 1950s. All right? Um, Art Shallow then won later on in 1964 for the laser spectroscopy, but he's one of the people that helped figure out how to change the technology to make it work in the light. But it's really this man who did not get to win a Nobel Prize, but Ted Main was the first one on May 16, 1960, to have a working laser. All right, and so that's the birth of the laser, and this is what um, helped us get to nonlinear optics. So what's so special about a laser? Uh, first of all, these lights that are shining on us, of course, let go of photons of every color. This is why then we have all of the colors to shine on us, and so that all the colors of our clothes then get reflected. That's great. It also goes in all directions, which also works great for lights, because then we're all lit up. These photons, though, do not talk to each other at all. They could care less what each other are doing. You know, and each photon goes in the direction it wants to go, and when it wants to go. But with a laser, we have the light, and the light is told, you know, which way to go by the previous photon. And this is why you can see my green laser pointer so well. Okay, it's only a milliwatt of power, and yet it's shining on this. It probably is 100 watts coming out of there. But all of my light is pointed in one direction, and so you're seeing the brightness, which is the, you know, again, the intensity, light per unit area. It goes in one direction, it's one color, and also they talk to each other. If one's peaking, they're all peaking. If one's troughing, they're all troughing. And so this is how you get a giant wave, classically. Right. So how does this giant wave, though, help us do zonal linear optics? Well, I like to think about it more in the photon picture. Because when I say that the wave is getting bigger and bigger classically, what we're saying is that it's the total energy per unit time energy of one photon multiplied by the number of photons. And so that photons per unit volume is what really is the same thing as intensity. All right, now regular light like this has them all going, and I like to point out that they're all at their own frequency or they're all dancing to their own beat. And they also don't care how anybody else is dancing, which is why they cannot crowd onto the dance floor. Now we can use lenses and focus the light down, and it looks like it's going to a point but there's still a limit of the wavelength. And that's one micron. Your human hair is about 50 microns. So it's small, but it's not that small if you compare it to the size of an atom. That's 10,000 times smaller, okay? So that with this kind of light, sunlight, the brightest light, traditional light you could do, the chances of finding more than one photon in the interaction volume of the atom was too small to see. But when the laser came along, and it was Bloomberg who won his Nobel Prize with Art Shallow for laser spectroscopy, but like Maria Meyer is like the mother of multi-photon physics, he's like the father of nonlinear optics, okay? The parents of twins. Anyway, um, so I put this picture here. Now, here's all of the laser photons. They're all dancing to the same beat. They're also all dancing together to the same beat. And this is why they can crowd onto that dance floor. And so it was, back in 1961 then, that chance of having two photons in the interaction volume, one part in a million to 10 million, of finding those two photons there. So what has any of this got to do with me getting a PhD with Gerard Bruner? When I joined Gerard's group, he gave me this paper written by Stephen Harris. He had written the paper in 1973. It's a theoretical paper. And his point was, it's great that we have lasers now. The lasers are invisible to the infrared. But wouldn't it be nice to have that same coherent, uh, intense radiation up towards the X-rays? Wouldn't it be nice if we get at least to the XUV, if not the X-rays? We're still working on getting to the X-rays. We've gotten to the XUV now. All right, so we have these different schemes. Now, when I talked about what we were going to go with shows, I didn't talk about symmetry. But if you have isotropic, homogeneous medium. You can't have even order nonlinearities. All right. So, but you can use the resonances that would show up in what this is just the students, the denominator functions. Okay? And so the fourth order one shows up, it can help the fifth order. You can't see a fourth order nonlinear. So the first one in that Taylor series that would show up is the fifth. 
So if you look, this 3 and 5 actually use the same 4 photon resin. So it's 4 photons up, 1 down, 4 photons up, 1 up. This 5 and 7 use the 6 photon resonance, 1 down, 1 up. When he finally got down to 15, he went, who cares about the 13? We're trying to get to low, you know, low wavelengths or high frequencies. So he had these schemes, and Gerard gave me this paper, and he did, if, you know, think about this, do you want to do this for the PhD, and if you do, come up with a scheme. So I thought that seemed interesting. I came up with a scheme. I was going to use an eighth order resonance in twice ionized nickel. So I had two parts to my PhD thesis. One part was to figure out how to make a cold plasma of twice ionized nickel. It has to be cold because the harmonic generation has to start in the ground state of the twice ionized nickel. The only way I had to do it was with a, a laser produced plasma, and they make hot plasmas. They don't make cold plasmas. I never did figure out how to make a cold plasma of twice ionized nickel, so we can forget about that part of my thesis. <laughs> I forgot about that part of my thesis. I, although I was still in my seventh year trying to work on it, but that's beside the point. The other part of my thesis was I didn't just need two photons in the volume. I needed nine photons in the volume. So I didn't just need a laser. I needed an intense laser. And so the other part of my project that obviously was successful was trying to figure out how to make an intense laser. Now I'm going to circle around and tell you what I did do for my PhD with it, and it is the multi-photon or even the high-intensity version of the photoelectric effect, which is why I started the talk with the photoelectric effect. Okay, so this is what I was aiming for. Let's talk about the laser. This is actually uh, the very first laser of George I got to see. It's a dye laser, so we already have pulses short enough. I saw this beautiful red and green laser and thought, who doesn't want to work on this? It's like working on a Christmas tree all the time. And since I'm standing in Armenia, I do want to tell you that it was an Armenian Canadian that met me my first week in uh, Rochester and said, oh, if you want to study lasers, I know who you want to study with. And so it was Beatrice Athea that took, introduced me to Gerard, and this is how I got started for sure. So he showed me this laser, and I thought, wow, I really want to work on this. I never did get to work with this laser. That's also the point. So we have short pulse lasers, but dye lasers are a type of laser that can't get to big energies. I'll explain that later. Right across the hall, hall was the reason for the whole building. I did my research at the Laboratory for Laser Energetics. This is a Department of Energy funded facility for laser fusion. Laser fusion is an application that requires energy in to get energy out. So this is a big energy laser. <laughs> this is not a big powerful laser, this is a big energy laser. This laser back in the 1980s put out a kilojoule. Right? This puts out a millijoule every second. The laser that I developed put out a millijoule. This put out a kilojoule. Okay? This is big. You can't tell in this picture, but this is like sitting on a football field. Okay? This thing here is the size of a human adult. Okay? This is a big, big laser. And so we have big lasers, and I'll explain why I have to big uh, later. Uh, we have big lasers that could put out a lot of energy, and we have short pulse lasers. All we have to do is be able to put them together to have a powerful laser. So what happened when you try to put them together? In between, in between these two lasers, there was something called the glass developed laser. This was the laser that was one arm of the big laser, because you don't put it on 24 arms until you've tested it on one arm. And so they went ahead in the 1970s and tested what happens if we put a short pulse through this big amplifier do we get big peak powers? And they found out, no, you do not. So it was, they ran it at eight nanoseconds and got the kilojoule out. This is just saturation. Below saturation, you see it's a straight line, and it actually goes with power. So like one joule, one picosecond, 100 picoseconds, 100 joules. And so this surprised them. There was no reason to think that it should be power um, dependent. It should be energy dependent if you think about damage. The damage is what happens when they put the short pulses down. So let's explain it because it was not understood at the time, and it's a nonlinear optical effect. We're stopping. All right. So again, we had to study nonlinear optics in the 70s in order to understand what was going on. 
And so, again, these glass lasers are homogeneous and isotropic, so there's no second order. So we just have the first one and the third one. And I'm just going to pull out one of these E's out here. And remember, regular old polarization from just regular light is epsilon naught psi E. And so we just call everything in the bracket now this new psi. And this is the normal one. This is the one that gives us a normal index of refraction. And then we have this other term. This term is much smaller compared to that, so we're going to use the binomial expansion those of you really watching the equations, wanting where, why is there a term of E? And so this is our new index of refraction. And remember, E squared is the same as intensity. We just put some more factors in here. And so what does that mean? What does it matter that you have an you know, intensity dependent uh, thing? So we're going to go into our fiber, or into our, into our laser amplifier with a plane wave. Okay, so I'm going to do the wave coming at you. <laughs> so we have this plane wave. Now, if it was low power, I would stay a plane wave. But at the end, what I have with laser beam is this Gaussian beam. So I'm the most intense in my head and less intense down at my wings at my fingertips. So my fingertips only see n not a normal index of refraction. So I'm going to travel at the speed of light divided by that n not. But at the center, I'm much more intense. So I'm going to travel slower. So as I go, I've curved in. And so I've had it like a lens. I've started to curve in. So this is why it's called self-focusing. The power itself makes the beam focus. But what happens when the beam focuses? It used to be a big beam, but now it's a smaller beam. That means that it's still zero, going to zero at the edges, but more intense at the center. So it goes faster, faster, faster. Now if you look at the slide, you can tell I made this slide. All my Nobel slides were made by a communications team, so they know PowerPoint better than me. So don't worry too much. This is not a mathematical thing. It's not a you know, beautiful diagram, it's just me playing a PowerPoint. So it's just the best I could do to see that it just keeps getting faster, 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 faster until it collapses. And then it's damaged. But what we saw when this damage happened was not just a ball of damage. If you can imagine this glass rod being made out of jello or gelatin, and taking a long hypodermic needle and sticking it all the way down and pulling it back out and seeing that whole track of damage, that's what we saw entire line of damage right down the center of the rod. When I was asked for a, something for the Nobel Museum, I called down to the ladies who loved it. Any chance you still have any of those rods that we have those long lines of damage? That would be a great one. Now, they still have one of my laser rods in a box, my hand right on the box. But it was, it was still interesting to use. But that's what we donated. But anyway, um, it's too bad. I teach non optics now in grad school. I wish I had kept one of the broken rods just to show this beautiful line of damage. So that made people scratch their heads. What was going on? Now, it was these guys, Lauren Shen and Berkeley, that figured it out. So now we have the Gaussian beam. Oh, I should have pointed out. Go back one. That this self focusing distance, how long it takes to fall down is the total power. There's the beam size, total power, the edge always goes to zero. And so the more powerful the beam, the more intense and faster it all happens, and that's why it's a shorter distance if you have more power. But now we're going to talk about what happens if you put a pulse of light in. And I'm just going to divide the time into five segments. So we can see this A segment in the center has the most power, the B has less power, and the C has even less power. And so this part of the pulse focused here, the B is focused here, and the C is focused here. And of course the power isn't divided by five, it's continuously changing, and that's why you see damage here, back here, and then back again. All right? So this is known as the moving um, focus model. Yes, moving focus model is self-focused. So when we saw these great lines of damage, two things happened. People like Loy and Shen went and went, hmm, I wonder what's going on, we have to investigate this, and the non-linear optics people try to do experiments, and the laser jocks like me went, do not put short pulses down, amplifiers, very expensive damage happens, <laughs> okay? So that's the very word in the 70s, you could not put short pulses down the big amplifiers. And that's why we needed CPA to come along. So this is your tonight partying at the banquet in uh, December uh, 10th, 2018. And um, really, I think I have the simplest of the uh, Nobel Prize in Physics. Uh, okay. So even if you're not a physicist, I think you're going to understand uh, what I come on the Nobel Prize for. I like to say that I built a laser hammer. Laser fusion needs energy in, energy out. 
But if you think about the application of driving a nail into a piece of wood, you can push with all your might and the nail doesn't go in. But you pick up a hammer and slap it in, it goes in. So there are applications that care about the energy, and there's other applications that care about the energy per unit time. And so here's my laser hammer. I want a lot of energy. I want it in a short amount of time. I do not want my laser hammer inside the amplifier causing damage. So very simple. You start with a low energy, short pulse. You stretch it, make it a long pulse. All right, that's it. And then you amplify it safely so it has energy, still long, so the photon density is still not that high. And then when it's safely out of the laser, you go ahead and you compress it back to be a short pulse. All right, and so in my day, we did it in air. Even now, air is a nonlinear medium for the lasers that we have today, and so this compression happens in that. All right, so how did I do it? So it looks like, because I told you I never used this laser, and I never used the red and green part, <laughs> and it's a different title now. This is the laser I used. It's a neodymium YAG laser. It actually lasers in the infrared, which is why we see nothing here. This is actual frequency doubling. That same thing that I said came about in 1961, one part in a million to 10 million. We now have enough laser intensity that it was working at 10%. So this was a two watt average power laser and it made 200 milliwatts of green to run this dilation. But that still meant that most of the two watts was hitting this mirror and the green, 99.99% goes this way. But the infrared came right on through to a beam dump. And so it was wasted energy and so that's the laser I was given leftover laser to do my experiment with. And there I am in 1984. A few things about this picture first. This is on the cover of the quarterly uh, report for LLE, and so they always put students on the cover. Um, we have to show that I was laser safe, so I'm wearing my beautiful 1980s goggles. Um, but the photographer did not like the green glass in covering my eyes. So actually I'm not wearing them, I'm just wearing the frames. Okay, but it's okay because it's an infrared laser. You can't tell if it's on or off, so it was off. Um, so instead of a beam dump, I now have a fiber mount. I have 1.4 kilometers of fiber. This is to do three things. One, there's obviously no room left in this lab for me to build my system. So when the light went through the fiber, another student who was not so claustrophobic or afraid of heights as me went through the air duct in the middle of the night because it's against the rules and took the fiber to the other end of the laboratory for laser energetic where the different lab had been cleared out for me to do my experiment. Two, the neodymium YAG laser is 100 picoseconds, 150 picoseconds, and we want it shorter. So we're going to use nonlinear optics in the fiber to make that happen. I'm going to explain that. That's what my demo up here is for. And finally, once we have all the colors from the nonlinear optics, then we have dispersion. That is the fact that the light travels at different speeds through the fiber, depending on its wavelength. And so this is my pulse stretching. Okay? So that's the three things I'm going to do with that fiber. So first, you know, all of a sudden we start teaching lasers, and when I first explain lasers to you, I point out a laser like this has only one color. If you have only one color, it goes on forever in time. So this isn't purely one color either, because nothing goes on forever in time. But if you want a really short pulse, you must have many, many, many colors. You also need something, because obviously these uh, lights here don't put up short pulses, and yet they have many, many, many colors. So we have something in our laser called a mode blocker. It is the same as it have in an orchestra theater. Now when you go here in orchestra, and they're warming up all of their instruments, they're all playing their own notes when they feel like it. So they're like a light bulb. Okay, it doesn't, it doesn't sound good at all. They're all just playing their own notes. But when the conductor decides to start, he brings down his baton, and they all play their notes together. Beautiful music is made. And so this is what a mode locker does for us. It says all colors go here, now, right now. Peak, now. Now as you go away from this peak, because of different distances to the troughs, before long, you have as many peaks as you have troughs. And that's what, you know, you add them all up and they go to zero. And the more colors you bring in, the faster you go to zero. And so this is for a transform theory that you know you have, you have to have a huge bandwidth. It is not the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. For all of you physics students, I just, I just like to make this little beef that I have with the whole physics community that they call it the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. Why Heisenberg gets his name with it, I don't know. Because Fourier came long before. Anyway, just saying that. So it's you know more bandwidth, you get a shorter pulse. 
So we need bandwidth. So here's the map, but I'm going to show you because I'm an experimentalist how to understand this. This is the same as what I talked about self-focusing, but we're going to be inside a fiber, and the fiber is guided. So it's going to stay plain wave, no matter what we do, through the single mode fiber. But we still have a pulse in time. Because we have a pulse in time, then the peak of the pulse drop is slower than the edges. That's what this is telling me. Well, I'm not going to explain the math, because those of you who like math, you need to math. Okay. So I have my slinky, and it's unfortunate that it's yellow in the center, so I hope you can see the yellow in the center. One thing I was also taught um, when I was getting my PhD is that light only travels left to right. <laughs> so, so the light, this way, right? so light is going in this direction. So this is going to be my pulse. If I have what's known as a Fourier transform with the pulse, which is what we want, the spacing of these, these are my phase fronts, you will see they're equally spaced. And so it looks like I only have a single color inside this pulse. But I just showed you that if I have a pulse at a certain time, all the colors are there. But if they're all timed up to be right here, it looks like only that central color is here. Okay. But now, this was 150 picosecond pulse. And I wanted it short. So I needed more colors. And I wanted almost 100 times more colors. Now, what's a color? The color is the distance between the face fronts. So here's the beginning of my pulse. It's traveling at the normal speed of light and glass. Here's the end of my pulse. It's traveling at the normal speed for in glass, okay, which is the speed of light divided by 1.5. Now, so the pulse length is not going to change because of this. It's going to be this long when it gets you know, further down the uh, fiber. My fiber is 1.4 kilometers. Oh, I think like that's actually where I used to tell. Anyway, um, here's the peak of my laser pulse. And because of nonlinear optics, it's traveling slower than here and slower than here. So if you could just be in the, you know, going along with the pulse, be in the rest of the time of the pulse, this guy is moving backwards. Now if you watch, you'll see that I've pulled the face fronts apart here and made the colors redder. And I've pushed them together here, and I've made them bluer. And so I've added colors that weren't there before, both red at the front and blue at the back. That's what this picture is also showing, that up here, they're all traveling together at the same free, uh, speed. So it starts at just that, whatever this wavelength is, it goes red, goes back to that wavelength, blue, and then back to that wavelength. This is what we call a chip. I also didn't explain why do, you know, I call it chip pulse amplification and that's stretched pulse amplification. We're going to stretch the pulses by dispersion, so our colors will appear at different times, and that's the definition of a chirp. A bird's chirp is because the audio frequency changes in time. So, this kind of chirp, though, we cannot compress. Now, let me go back and tell you the story first. Because, again, it's a good story for graduate students to hear. 1.4 kilometers of fire. Why? Why that length? I was giving my talk at the University of Toronto early afternoon, and she asked this question, why was it 1.4 kilometers long? And I could tell she was very disappointed in the answer. I could tell she was thinking, you won the Nobel Prize for this work. Tell me you did some complicated, you know, theory to figure this all out. Yeah, I did not. And I'm about to explain why I did not. But, but it did not. Once you are decided, you're going to see why we decided in 1984 to do it right then, right now. There was no time to write a proposal and get money, right? We needed to do it, we needed to do it now. So the amplifier that I got was the one Gerard did his PhD on in the 1970s. He called home to France. He said, is that laser still there? Can you ship it over to the States? Yes, we did. He called Corny Glass, which is just an hour south of Rochester, and said, we are doing a very important experiment. Don't you want to be part of it? Don't you want to donate that specialty fiber? Now, another word for specialty fiber is very expensive fiber. Okay, so they have this very expensive specialty fiber, which was for the wavelength of the again. This is different than, the, you know, most of you make fibers for communications, so that's 1.5 microns. This laser was 1 micron. They donated very generously two and a half kilometers of this specialty fiber. Now, apparently, most people that want two and a half kilometers of fiber 
One, because they want to run it down two and a half kilometers of length. So only one end was shown. So I had to spend a day of my life unspooling and respooling the fibers so that I could get to both ends of the spiders. We didn't even have another spool. We had an old film canister, again, the young ones won't know what this is, but anyway, we used to be film canisters. And we put corks all around, and I spent a day of my life doing this. Round and round we went, with two and a half kilometers, and then when I put the light through it, the light did not come through. So I pick up my IR viewer, and there it is, coming through, and as Murphy's Law would tell you, almost in the middle. The bigger of the two ends was 1.4 kilometers, and so that's why. I used one on four kilometers. So I could have calculated what I want and then just been disappointed. This way, we just went. Okay, so sometimes just go. Alright. So it the cell phase modulation actually happens pretty early in the fire. We do not need 1.4 kilometers. Why did we start this work in 1984? We had gone to the big laser conference, Clio, and then right at the same time, the week before or after, was the ultra press conference. And everybody was talking about doing pulse compression of neodymium yang lasers. And they were, told, they were compressing this 100, 150 picoseconds down to 92 picoseconds, using the cell phase modulation to get the colors. But more than that, they used disposals. Mm, I'm go. All right. They also had to use dispersion. So let me just explain dispersion. So here's the phase of light. If you just take a snapshot down the length of a fiber holding time constant, you have the phi is omega, the speed of light, z. So if you take that central frequency, this frequency you show, and you just go down, it gets to be a peak again at some distance z, phase velocity, z over n, times time. But now you have um, the peak of the pulse. The peak of the pulse it travels with what's known as the group velocity. Now remember, the peak of the pulse is where all the colors turn off. But now all the colors are probably slightly differently. So where does that peak happen again? This phase, M, is frequency dependent. This is dispersion. So you can't just say that phi is linear with omega. So we have to write it out using this, another expansion in the omega um, over and over. This term here, the derivative of the phase with respect to frequency, one over that gives you this group velocity. That tells you the speed and the peak of the pulse, and it is not the same as this one. Now, unless your pulse is really short, we don't care about that. It's the next term, the derivative of this group velocity, that says how we spread out. So let's take this pulse, and instead of dividing it in five groups of time, we're going to look at three chunks of color. The red travels faster than the green, travels faster than the blue. So each of these are the you know, time of the original one. But now you'll see that this is going to be a longer pulse because the blue went fast, then the green, and then the red. And so, well, actually, the red went first, this is the early time. And so you have this nice linear chirp. This is what we want. We want nice linear, the red changing the green, changing the blue as a nice linear curve. We know how to compress that. Cell phase modulation gave us an S. This is what we want. 1984, this came out. They said if you want to get really good short pulses in fiber optic pulse compression of yay lasers, this is what you're going to do. You're going to use a long fiber. And if you use a long fiber, then as you make the colors, the colors start to come apart in time. And they keep working together so that as you make the red at the front, the red is moving further to the front. And you're making the blue and going further and further back. And eventually it keeps getting longer and keep making more colors. And you get not really linear, but not bad. Okay? This we saw in 1984. It was like a light bulb that went off. Gerard already had the idea of CPA, but he didn't know how to do it. And when this came out, it was like, now we know. This is what we're going to do. And this is also why he said, we've got to do it, and we've got to do it now. So here, if I, if I got enough time? Yeah. Are you sure? Tell, tell me when to stop. How much time do I have? Half an hour. Or I still have an hour? Oh, okay. Um, okay, so laser amplification. So how does the laser work? Here we have a bunch of atoms. Again, I do like to joke with my atomic and molecular physics friends. Um, I'm an optical physicist. 
So only photons have personality in my time, and atoms just sit there. Okay, so these are the type of things are atoms. So um, these are atoms, and so a laser has to get excited, and the energy has to come from somewhere. So in the neodymium uh, Yagen blast system, you pump it with an uh, ultraviolet flash lamp, and you excite. In the dye laser case, we excite with the green pump laser, okay? Now I told you that it could not be a big energy laser. And that's because in dye, it's a big gain, a lot of gain. It wants to give its energy up. It just wants to give the energy up. And so it does not wait long for a photon to come, and so it's much more like a light bulb. If you try to make a great big dye cell, it would just blow like a light bulb. And it would give away its energy in all directions. But a neodymium glass laser has one of the best storage energies. It's just that if I hang on this energy, I will wait until a photon comes along. And when a photon comes along, see, it has personality. Um, it's got the same color, okay? It's not going to be absorbed. It's going to be caused stimulated emission because the atoms in its excited state have the very same energy. And so it says, hey, I can take your energy, and we can walk hand in hand. And so those two go find two more atoms, and they become four, and the four become eight. This is how all these are start. It starts with one noise photon going in the right direction. And this is the exponential gain region. And so this is when you get the most gain. But you can see that in this region, you've left most of your energy behind you. And so this is one of the reasons you must have a laser cavity with mirrors going back and forth, because you cannot, this is just a waste of energy. You have to get to the point where it's like a snowplow, and I understand, even though it's hotter than hot here, you do have winters. So you'll know that in the, um, with the snowplow, snowplows, that this is, you want to come in here and just take the energy out, okay? So glass has, the glass has uh, energy saturation flux of five joules per square centimeter. So this is also why the big glass laser kind of gets so big. It starts with the laser, very tiny beam, you get to five joules per square centimeter, you put it over, you know, 30 microns. You blow the beam up, you take that energy at five joules per square centimeter, and you keep blowing it up at each amplifier stage, so that you always have the same energy per unit area at the end of each stage. Um, but just keep getting bigger. So now, the nonlinear optics, though, says what is the density of photons? And so once you know what the photons per unit area have to be, the nonlinear optics says this is what, how much you have to stretch the pulse. So for near the glass, you must stretch the pulse to a nanosecond, which if we were here in the States, I would say this is the one time American units makes sense, because one nanosecond is exactly one foot. <laughs> OK, so this is a nanosecond long pulse, Travels along. Okay? My 1.4 kilometers of fiber got me to do a third of that. This is why I did cause damage. <laughs> I, you know, if I took it all the way out, I caused some damage. Um, if I'd had the two and a half kilometers, I wouldn't have gotten all the way toward the other side anyway, so what the hell? Okay, so, uh, but, but nowadays they would, they would stretch it to an end. Alright. So, then all that's left is to compress, and this was known in 1969. So you use two gradients, they're parallel. A gradient is like a prism, bends the colors on um, different angles. And if you watch, now our rat has had the green and had the blue, but the rat had to travel a longer path from here. But the blue has gone the same distance from here to there as the red from here to there. So when it comes off the second gradient, and Tracy knew this back in 69, they would all be timed up together. That's also in a long line, which is useless. And so we actually put the gradients half that distance apart. We put a retro reflector here, it goes back, it's back to a round dot, and a short pulse. And that's it. And that's my uh, thesis, and this is the whole thing. So the egg, and the 1.4 kilometers, we stretched it to 350 pico. Reasonably linear chirp. I will say that, of course, the front end gets most of the game, and so you will not get the exact same spectrum you started with. Um, both in time or in spectrum, this is showing the chirp, but in time we would also have all the red having energy. I'll tell you the biggest ones now, the world's most powerful lasers actually do a double compression, but they go back the up opposite direction and make the blue catch up to the red in the final amplifiers. And after that we go with the gradients, and there it is. And this is the uh, result. I had no way to measure that my pulses were short, and so it was my friend who called St. Williamson got a brand new street camera and he said my street camera can measure it. He came in and worked with me one night and he got the result off an Avalon. The Avalon said that so many pixels 125 picoseconds. 
It was four pixels wide, which was the limit, and that was two picoseconds. So we knew that it was no longer than two picoseconds. And I compressed the oscillator pulses to 1.5 pico, so that was about all we were going to be able to say. And so that should have worked late one Thursday night. So back to the beginning of my talk. I started with the photoelectric effect. I already told you, never figured out how to make cold plasma twice higher as nickel. So this lovely man, Silon Chin, who looks like he's younger than me, but he was on his second dumb, what's the word, uh, what I'm trying to think of? That's bad. Thank you. Might as well fill in my words for me now, in my old age. Sabbatical. He won't be on his second sabbatical, this man, even though he looks like he's a kid, like me. Anyway, this was a brand new assistant professor. As he walked into the laboratory of laser energetics, he was told you're in charge of CPA experiments. This was a brand new grad student, Steve Boggs. I just added this because I was just at MIT Lincoln Labs working hours. And this is me, obviously. Well, hopefully that's obvious. I'm not very young there. But anyway, um, it was this man. He came to do the sabbatical. And he said, I want to be the first one to be CPA. And I want to study multi photon ionization. And I'm thank goodness. And he convinced Gerard that this is what I could do for my PhD, because the other was never going to work, and I'm in my seventh year. You know, I needed something that was going to work easier. So we switched and we did multi-photon ionization thanks to Simon Chen. Forever grateful. All right, so he was trying to see what thing is happening. If it was still in the nonlinear optics regime, we would be giving the energy to the electron to kick it out of the well. So this man did it's um, Misha Ivanov who gave me this analogy, and I think it's so wonderful. You can imagine me having a, like a ping pong ball in sort of a bowl. The perturbative effect would be either I can sort of tip the ball very slightly, and you would just see that it goes back and forth, back and forth. And it's like pushing a child on a swing. You push the first time, they go a little bit, you push the same amount, it goes a little bit bigger, a little bit bigger, a little bit bigger, and you can eventually get it to maybe. Now, with regular light, you never could. It just, you know, dribbles down the bottom. But with nonlinear optics, you can pick up the speed, pick up the speed, pick up the speed, and perturbatively kick it out. On the other hand, classically, you can take that bolt and just tip it on over, and the ball comes out. And in between, you need quantum mechanics. In between, you can say there's a barrier, but quantum mechanically, I can tell. Now, most people say in most times that this is now what happens in high intensity laser physics. This is, what, this is the perturbative nonlinear optics that follows the Taylor expansion. The math and physics changes from here to here. But what my PhD showed was we had so much intensity in the long haul, in the, a long wavelength, we just tipped it on over and the electrons flew out. And so it was this new understanding of how light and matter interacted that got other people thinking, you know what, we can use this to plot change. Have transparent object like the cornea or like the glass. Cool. Alright, so here's one of Shard's um, slides that he's been showing for a long time. It used to be vertical instead of horizontal. But anyway, let me just show. We start with the invention of the laser, I don't know if the intensity was before the laser bit it, but I'm zooming on that. Once it was very quickly that we had these two different ways to make the pulses shorter. This is in the 70s where we could not amplify the short pulses. CPA came along in 1985. It took 10 years before the first one of those kilojoule lasers used CPA. Gerard wanted them to do it right away. Gerard started pounding the paper and saying, come on, come on, come on. And you can imagine, you know, damaging one of those very expensive rods that took a while. But it wasn't just that. Why did it take 10 years? It took five years for Gerard to convince anyone to do it. That's five years. The other five years, though, was the fact that the real problem is the gradients. Glass can handle five joules per square centimeter. My gradients can handle 50 millijoules per square centimeter. And so they had to figure out a way to get a kilojoule of energy on a gradient. And also, you have to holographically or rule them perfectly. Even if you can crush them, the whole things have to be perfect or a large area. And so they figured both how to get the, a damage to one joule per square centimeter and how to rule them beautifully over an entire meter. Okay? And once they had that, they could do a padawa. Now, when Gerard used to show this in a vertical scale, he goes, now look at this, by now we should be up here in this orange region. What is this orange region? It's going to be past the Schwinger limit. What's the Schwinger limit? What is vacuum? You might think it's nothing, but it's not. Quantum mechanics people here, people will tell you it's not nothing. It is really dipoles. It is 
um, electrons and positrons, or matter and antimatter put together. But let's do the electron and the positron. You can take the rest mass of the electron and the rest mass of the positron. They are held together by a Compton wavelength. You take that energy, you divide by that distance, that gives you force. And that force is the force that you would get if you focus to 10 to the 29 watts per square centimeter. And so we're hoping to get to 10 to the 29 watts per square centimeter. So we can just focus into nothing and watch matter come up. And you might just think, why? Well, just for fun. But the reason that I think would be cool, and it was um, Gert Loops that came to give a talk at Waterloo quite a few years ago now, when Gerard asked him to think about why you'd want to do this. Again, he's an optics person. But he kept saying, what is epsilon naught? We use it. It's in all of our equations, right? But what is it? Once you leave epsilon naught, once you say, you know, whatever the reason is a limit to the speed of light, that is always about the dipole response. But in a vacuum, the dipoles are there, the, the electrons and the positrons, matter and antimatter, but it's, this, you know, it's, the, it's the positive and negative charge that we care about. And is it not maybe those dipoles in the vacuum that are giving us epsilon naught and telling us that we can't go faster than the speed of light? And so this is what would be kind of cool, is if we could get a region where we actually change uh, the speed of light, and really change the speed of light, not what they talk about today with slow and fast light. All right, so that's what we're aiming for. You can see that we aren't getting there anytime soon. Gerard and I show this slide just a little bit different than each other, and I do show that we are rolling over a bit, right? And so I do like to point out to all the grad students, it's time for another Nobel Prize winning idea to kick us on top again if you want to get to the sugar limit. So start thinking about it, and hopefully you can do it. These are the record holders right now. Eli has the most powerful laser in the world at 10 kilowatts. And Korea has only a four kilowatt system, not the 10, but they have focused it to wavelength, uh, single wavelength dimensions, and so they have reached the intensity since COVID, it was in 2021, um, of 10 to 23 watts per square second. So we still have six orders of magnitude to go, but we've gone uh, about 12. Okay. Um, oh, okay, so let's just finish talking about uh, counting, uh, but let's go back to the 10 to the 13, 10 to 14 watts per square centimeter. And, you know, you can get beautiful slides. If you come to Starman, so you'll see me during this talk, where I will show uh, a video of cutting steel with um, CW lasers. But it's a thermal process. You're really just melting the steel. You're evaporating the steel, okay? If it's a thermal process, the heat goes. And so you can only cut so well. But with a laser hammer, you're coming in there, and you're not absorbing them. You're just coming and kicking those electrons right off, okay? So not only can you now cut transparent objects, because you're not trying to absorb them, but you also don't have to cut any more from the surface. If it's not transparent, you have no choice. You have to cut from the surface on down. But from something transparent, you only have a hammer at the focal spot. So now you use tight focusing. And at the surface of the glass, it's a big spot, not intense, but only down here is intense. So I'm going to show you the surgery. If you're squeamish, I'm going to not to look. There it goes. So this is now, you know, 24 million. That's since 2001 to 2018. Dog, you know, see, just to hold your eyes still. And then you're going to see, and the laser's going to just raster scan to your comes. Raster scan back and forth at a kilohertz. It's going to take 17 seconds to raster scan through. It looks like it's damaging the outside, but this is why they kind of flop with that laser, because that's where your nerves are. You don't get to poke yourself in the eye to know that it hurts on the outside of your eye. And so here's the part that's going to be hard for you to just walk around and have the surgery. You have to be awake, and now the surgeon's going to come in and lift that flap. Okay, and so I'm going to let it go so you can see that indeed we have cut flat with the uh, CPA version. My version. Yeah, 24 million people have watched this cap a bit more. Okay, there you go. Oh, I don't know. I thought that was great. Okay, I'll just finish with this. Um, 2018 was the first year that there were two women that won Nobel Prizes in physical science. So Francis Arnold won chemistry when I was winning physics, and here the two of us are. What we're doing here is, this is December 10th, 2018, but it's at 10 in the morning, at 3 in the afternoon, so we're not in our ball games and, and quite tight tails. We are practicing, so we are behind stage waiting for our musical cues. Now, of course, we can wait for the musical cue, but we also have somebody wearing a white hat who's going to lead the parade, so I'm thinking she really is the only one who needs to listen to that musical cue. 
But if you watch, the men are all just standing there, like, you know, waiting for their musical cue or up and standing the board. France and I, the entire week, entire week of Nobel Week, had a great time. We were there for a good time, and we enjoyed the whole experience. And then Friday, that is what I did, the land of me beside the King of Sweden on December 10th, 2018. So thank you for your attention. Um, and so you can 
you get almost 100 degrees of fairness and amplify it up. Other questions? Yes, please. Thank um, you for the presentation. Um, I wanted to ask about the self processing process. I couldn't understand, understand what's the physics behind it. Why does it happen? Okay, so um, let me explain the nominee objects classically. You should explain it quantum mechanically, but I'm going to explain it. So, first, what is the index of refraction? And I don't think we teach the physical process of why does light slow down right there. Okay. So what happens is that when the light comes to an atom, it is like I said the same thing as you pushing a kid on a swing. Right? And you push the kid on the swing. Now when you push, that kid does not actually start moving right away. So that's the phase difference. Right? And so there's a phase difference between when you feel like pushing and when the swing is going. Okay? Now when you swing, and you see, I don't know about here, in North America we got safety conscious in my day. We used to get to have boom swings. They were very comfortable, and we would swing and swing and swing. Now they make us all, kids have to be in these awful plastic things that hurt, so nobody swings anymore. But if you're lucky and you still have boom swings, you will swing. And then, if you feel yourself, like when you're just little, and it goes back and forth, this is just normal pendulum, and you would just have X or Y pose or sign, right? But when you swing way up, you will always feel like you come, and then it goes back down again. And this is now your flat top. If you're no longer cosine or sine, you're flat top. So this is the classical version of melting your optics, same as if you take an uh, electrical amplifier and warp the sound. Okay. So this is what's happening. And so then that's what changes the phase, and that's what then is speed of light. The speed of light is watching one phase run try to move along. It really gets absorbed and re-emitted, and on it goes. Okay. So now. In, in the wings, it just has the regular, they're just swinging and they have their phase difference, but that's why you divide by 1.5, it's not in vacuum. But the one in the center is and then like this, and then coming back. And so its phase is delayed compared to the outside. And so that's why in the center where you're, you know, most intense, you're actually traveling slower compared to the edges. And that's why then the phase front is no longer flat all the way across. The, the phase front, if you imagine the phase front, is now curved all like this. And now you've made it even more intense because it's smaller, so it's until it just collapses to a point. Okay, so it looks like the same as like uh, optical focusing, it's just the different reason for the change. <coughs> it's, it's, oh, it's the same as optical focusing, but it's the light that's causing the difference in index and fraction. Oh, okay. And as you travel, it's becoming faster, 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 faster. So it would be like having um, gradient index um, optics but the gradient's changing it as you travel through. So it would be a 3D gradient optics. Uh, great, regular gradient lens, and then stronger and stronger as you travel. Thank you very much. Thank you. Other questions? Yes, please. Thanks again for accepting our invitation and for presenting the beautiful uh, uh, presentation. So uh, my question is, uh, could it be that there is a fundamental limit of uh, the intensity uh, accumulated in the vacuum? Because as you say, above some uh, value, we have some leakage of, like, uh, we get uh, electron positron pair. So could it be that there is some uh, fundamental limit there for a high intensity? So after well, some the point, question is, you're asking, so if let's go back and say it's not like the speed of like light. Light. So, so again, the fourth state of matter is a plasma, where everything is charged. And so then there's the critical density. And so as soon as you hit the critical density, you become it's that it's like a mirror and the light has to come back. So if we could blow apart so many uh, positrons and electrons to make that whatever that critical density of plasma would be, then of course the light would have to bounce back. So, so I think it's the same idea, is that to change the refractive index, at some point it becomes imaginary. So it has to bounce back. So, but not the, not the whole, uh, whole light bounces back, right? So there should be some, uh, like, uh, some... Some way from the smoke through? Yeah, so I, that, that's the question, so... That's right. <laughs> um, yeah, so, and obviously to get the pulse shorter, uh, first of all, we'll have to move up further to UV, right? Because we're already down to both um, all the dimensions we can get to at the wavelengths we're at. So we're going to have to go further but again, if you think about the out-second crowd, right? They really have 
these um, bandwidths that are enormous. And so I don't know, like with these enormous bandwidths, it's true. One, one part will see um, the plasma mirror and the other one will not. We haven't got that, I don't know what will happen. The next step. There's a nice question on this. Other questions? I have nothing for the rest. Hey, I mentioned that already tomorrow you will talk about the fact to second laser. I, I had some question for uh, there. But um, when you mentioned that it's damaging, it's damaging the optics and everything environment when the high power process are going to. What do you think about nowadays when everyone like uh, in integrated photonics try to bring these uh, ultra short process to the small chips, to the smaller, as much as possible smaller, like uh, picosecond, femtosecond uh, laser on chip? Do you think it's, and still it's failing? Do you think there is a way to overcome this damaging attitude? Because you mentioned that it's heat that doesn't let us to do it, but apparently not only. No, no, so you can, you can both. But uh, again, if we decide what 